Tennessee basketball back in the Sweet 16 and one win away from the second Elite Eight appearance in program history. Welcome into the Volunteer State. I'm Blake Topmeyer alongside the Knoxville News Sentinels, Mike Wilson and John Adams. Guys, a good start to the tournament. Obviously for Tennessee, pretty chalky in the region so far. Up next, Creighton in the Sweet 16. This is the matchup uh, that we were talking about a week ago that that we thought was likely. Uh, Creighton nearly didn't didn't get to this point, but won double overtime, so this matchup will happen. Uh, before we look forward, let's look backward first. Uh, Mike, let's start with you. Your thoughts on on how Tennessee got to the, this point and, and how they played through two games. Yeah, I thought obviously the opener against St. Peter's was a good reset after a two-game losing streak to close the regular season. And then that Texas game was one of the most tense games I think I've covered in a really long time. Uh, it seemed like our Tennessee, I think, got up by 12 or 9 uh, at different points, but it felt like the whole game was played within a single possession despite that score. Um, obviously, the shooting wasn't there for Tennessee, but I thought what was impressive is they were still able to lean on who they are and what they've been defensively. Uh, from a toughness, physicality, defense, rebounding type of perspective. Uh, and they did that so well that even with shots not falling, other than the very essential shots near the end, Tennessee was obviously able to move on. And I do think that would have been a catastrophic game to lose, um, given if you go out with a 3 of 25 three-point shooting performance. That's a, a really bad taste left in the mouths two years after you went 2 of 18 against Michigan. So – there was a good good amount of good things. There also were some concerning things. Just Tennessee hasn't shot particularly well um, outside of the St. Peter's game in the past few games. So um, some concerns, but I also thought the fact that obviously you found ways to win games in different ways is important this time of year. Um, yeah, I thought uh, St. Peter's first game, I mean, Tennessee looked impressive, but who wouldn't have? I thought St. Peter's should have been a 19th seed. Uh, it's a really and wait limited. wait a year or two we'll have that yeah oh, i'm looking geez. forward to it seeing more teams in the tournament uh more sec but I thought, yeah yeah the uh the texas game to me was just kind of an odd game in that it looked early on like tennessee kind of had i saw it a little differently than mike i felt like tennessee established it, itself as the superior team right away and a six-point lead in that game looked bigger than the number, I thought, because I thought Texas was so limited uh, offensively and Tennessee plays good defense. Then lo and behold, in the late in the game, all of a sudden Texas starts hitting shots, and I'm thinking, here goes Tennessee fading out of this tournament. And uh, to its credit, uh, it hung in there, made clutch free throws, and, and rarely does a team advance to the final four without having at least one scare, maybe two or three. So that was a good game to get out of the way. But I think this next next region in the Sweet 16 at least presents different challenges because you have a group of really good offensive teams in this region. Yeah, and, and so now Tennessee's got Creighton next. Uh, again, we talked about this potential matchup last week. Creighton nearly didn't make it to this point. They were losing, you know, in the closing minute against Oregon in regulation, uh, beat them in, in double overtime. After seeing, you know, the first week of, of the tournament, do you guys feel, I guess, more or less optimistic about Tennessee's chances uh, to get to the Elite Eight or beyond, or about the same as, as you were thinking kind of coming into the, into the tournament? Yeah, this is going to be a weird response, but I feel more confident, actually, just despite what happened in that game, because John is correct in saying Tennessee controlled that game against Texas, and I think that's why it would have been so catastrophic to lose. They were clearly the superior team. Uh, I mean, they, they physically dominated that game, uh, and that is – Something really encouraging, I think, going into a gaming, it's a Creighton team that probably plays more Alabama style offensively, um, just in terms of shot quality, shot selection. And, and that's where Tennessee's been comfortable all year. I mean, obviously beat Alabama twice, including at Alabama. So I, I took some encouraging things from this weekend, also because the reality is you're probably not going to shoot three of 25 from three again. Um, those shots are, are more likely to fall at some point, at least odds and variants say that would be the case. I mean, if Tennessee hits eight of 25 against Texas, that game's a blowout. Um, that obviously did not happen, but 
Um, so I was, I was encouraged, I, I thought, by the fact that Tennessee did see shots go down in one game and was able to physically dominate an opponent in the other. Um, I think Tobe Awaka was a sneaky big bright spot uh, from the first weekend for Tennessee. He was their best offensive player uh, for the most part against Texas. Might have had 20 and 10 if he wasn't in so much foul trouble. So seeing him play that way, giving that opportunity alongside Jonas Adu, that's encouraging to me going into a region where you're going to have to be really good on the interior. Yeah, I feel about the same as I did. Um, Maybe a little leaning toward Mike in that because I thought this was a game, it looked like there at the end, this is a game Tennessee's going to lose. And we've seen this movie before. Uh, where Tennessee Tennessee shoots badly, uh, disappears from the tournament bracket against a weaker team, uh, a tough team, but still a less talented team. However, on the other side, uh, Gonzaga impressed me. Um, Mm. I wouldn't be surprised at any result in those regional semifinal games. And I think uh, Purdue looked really good. Uh, to me, uh, it, it always looks good when it's perimeter players play well. Um, so I, I just think the Regent Tennessee, yes, uh, avoided uh, a terrible upset, but the region now, the final, the, the final four teams looks a little better maybe to me than I thought it did going into the tournament. Yeah, Purdue's obviously looked the part of of number one seed. You never know what's going to happen with Purdue. We talked about their history, you know, on the pod last week. And given what happened to them last year, you never know. Is there going to be a repeat of that? No danger of that in their second round game against Utah State. They they dominated. Um, And then, as you said, John Gonzaga has has come out and, and looked really strong too. And, and I'm not necessarily fading Creighton either because sort of what you said earlier, John, about Tennessee, you know, you don't usually get to a final four or beyond without having, you know, one game at least that kind of comes down to the wire. I sort of felt the same way about Creighton uh, with its win. I, I wasn't necessarily discouraged um, because it took two overtimes to beat Oregon. Oregon was a hot team. I thought both teams played relatively well. Creighton wasn't getting some shots to fall for stretches of that game. Uh, but then, you know, their, their veterans made some clutch plays late to help deliver that, that double overtime win for them. So as we look at these these four teams left in, in the region, we got Purdue and, and Gonzaga at the top end, potential matchups in, in the Elite Eight, should Tennessee make it that far. And then up next, Creighton here in the Sweet 16. Is there one team that you guys think profiles as the the toughest one for, for Tennessee? Is it the obvious? Is it Purdue? I know they got to get that far first, but um, would you look at Purdue or do you look at, at someone else as, as maybe being the, the biggest obstacle standing between Tennessee and the program's first Final Four uh, in its history? Yeah, I think it is Purdue. Uh, and just because Zach Eady exists, um, <laughs> that, there, there is just that element. I mean, no one else has a guy like that. No one else has a guy that can replicate that. You don't have to deal with that anywhere else. Um, I do think, as we talked about last week, Creighton presents a lot of matchup problems, too, because they have a 7-1 guy who can score a good bit, good rim protector, good defensive guy on the inside, and Kalkbrenner. Um, so I, I do think that matchup's tough. I think what's interesting about the overall draw, the other three offenses are really good. Um, I, I think all three are top 10-ish in efficiency. Um, looking at it now, Creighton's 11. Purdue is 3. Um, so And Gonzaga's 7. So it's a very good offensive uh, regional and, and that's where Tennessee again weirdly there's been a pivot for Tennessee this year where it seemed like they were so comfortable in those games in the mud drag it out bare knuckle brawl kind of kind of games we saw against Texas seemed like they were more comfortable in those in recent years but this Tennessee team seems to be more comfortable almost running and gunning with you uh, so that that does seem a little bit more of what you're going to see out of this regional to an extent um, I think especially with Creighton so it's an interesting draw overall, but I, I would say Purdue is probably that one um, just because that's where they present the biggest threat because they have a 7-4 post player. Yeah, I think uh, all four teams in this regional would like to play at a faster tempo. Purdue just needs to slow down for Zach Eady to get down in the post and set up shop. Uh, but other than that, I think that all the teams can can hit threes in transition. Tennessee will need to be able to do that. Um, I actually think Creighton could be a bigger challenge. 
uh, I think the choke factor would be enormous with Purdue in an Elite Eight game. I really do because of its past history. You could say that about Tennessee too, but but Purdue is the number one seed and has the number one player. And I think what goes wrong for Purdue is I, I don't think there will be a choke factor with Zach Eady, but I think the guys on the perimeter, as what's happened, ha, what happened last year against Farley Dickinson, I think those guys could be tight, and that could be Purdue's downfall. I thought in the I think Creighton is so good offensively. I know Tennessee plays good defense, but Creighton's offense is outstanding. I think it has a lot of weapons. I thought it missed shots that it probably normally makes. I haven't seen Creighton as as much as you have, Blake, but I thought it had some really good looks and didn't cash in on them. Uh, I could see it making those shots in another game. And I, I wouldn't rule out Gonzaga in this region either. Long, that's a program comfortable in the NCAA tournament. It's fallen short of a national championship. But yeah, I, I think Creighton is going to be a really chal- a really big challenge for Tennessee. Yeah, I think either either way, uh, I, don't, I don't really disagree with you. I think I think Creighton is going to be uh, a monster challenge. Thought that all along. I think Purdue would be too. Maybe it's because of that choke factor you mentioned, John, with with Purdue and the pressure that would be mounting on them in the Elite Eight. Um, and and I feel like maybe Tennessee has a little more pressure on, on it in the Sweet 16. I'll, or, or maybe it's just because it's the next game. Because I'll I'll say Creighton is uh, is the biggest obstacle to Tennessee getting to a Final Four. Um, I just look at what they did against or You know, they found a way to win that game on a day where. Um, you know, Baylor Shireman, their, their best player, he was a little bit off, didn't have a great shooting game. Trey Alexander, uh, you know, their, their other star guard, he dropped 20 points, but he missed a lot of shots and still, um, you know, they found a way. But the, the other thing with Creighton is, you know, they got three, four guys that do nearly all their scoring. If one or, or two of those guys have an off night, I mean, Tennessee's sitting pretty at, at that point. They are, th- those three or four guys are, are so tough, uh, particularly when, when the fourth guy, uh, Stephen Ashworth gets going like he did um, in, in overtimes there against Oregon, but their supporting cast doesn't go very deep. So they, they really need their, their big three, their big four um, to all be clicking on, on the same night. Now uh, they, they do that quite often. Normally, normally those guys are, are pretty good, but uh, you know, if, if you catch them where a couple of those guys are on an off night, then, then Tennessee's looking good. Um, Mike, I remember you saying, on the pod last week that sort of the elite eight was kind of the bar that, that you thought if for, for this to be declared a successful NCAA tournament, get to the elite eight or beyond. Is that sort of still the kind of the metric that, that you're looking at is uh, elite eight or, or beyond uh, you know, they can put the feather in the cap and say, well done, good season. Anything beyond that is, is gravy or uh, you know, how, how do you evaluate things at this point? Yeah. I mean, to me, to some extent, the tournament starts now. For Tennessee, um, I thought they were head and shoulders the best team in, in what they've called the Charlotte Invitational. Um, that's why, to me, it would have been so catastrophic to lose that Texas game because Tennessee is so superior as a team to that Texas team, which had good parts but just never really made a lot of sense together uh, for whatever reason. So, yeah, again, to me, the tournament begins now. Like, now it's time to say this is where this Tennessee team is different. Um, I do think a third Sweet 16 exit in the Rick Barnes tenure would be disappointing. Uh, I, I think Tennessee does need to get to that elite eight. And maybe at that point, it's the house money idea. Um, you know, you kind of touched on it guys. Like there's a little bit of a postseason bugaboo for all four of these teams in this regional, um, maybe most exaggerated with Tennessee and Purdue, but Gonzaga hasn't gotten over that hump and won a national title. They're in the sweet 16 every year. Uh, I think it's nine, nine straight, something to that extent, but, um, and Creighton got to the lead eight last year and, and bowed out then. So, all these teams are kind of looking to to do something that they don't always get done. Uh, so that exists everywhere. But yeah, I think, yeah, again, Tennessee, you need to get out of the Sweet 16 at some point. This is the best team that Rick Barnes has had to do that with. Um, Dalton Connect, again, being the reason why. Uh, their big three, Blake has asked to play well. And, and looking at this on paper, you're right. Creighton's got no depth. And that's where Tennessee has a big edge. But will its depth score? Um, will Tennessee get some points from Santiago Vescovi, Josiah Jordan James? Because this this strikes me as one of those games where one of those guys coming in and scoring 12, 13 points is going to make a huge difference. 
John, is it a lead eight or bust? Um, I don't know that it's a bust. I, I I agree that to constitute a successful season, Tennessee would need to make the elite eight. However, losing to any one of these teams, including Creighton in in the regional, losing in the Sweet Sixteen to me is not is not catastrophic. It's these are all really good programs. It's not the same as losing Florida to Florida Atlantic last year or to uh, Loyola Chicago years past or, or losing to a Michigan team that was, wasn't really that good and was a much lower seed. These, these are, uh, we've got four of the top five seeds in the region are still alive. And these are all good programs, all tournament texted uh, Creighton, uh, last season almost made the final four. It came up a, a shot short against uh, San Diego State. So, yeah, I just don't think I don't think losing in this tournament would carry the same weight as losing last year to Florida Atlantic, even though Florida Atlantic was obviously a good team. I just think it would be different. But still, have a successful season, you need to advance a little further. We were talking a week ago, guys, about you know who had the toughest region, which which region was was the easiest, and obviously Tennessee's has been pretty chalky. Even you know Gonzaga, <clears throat> excuse me, Gonzaga getting to this point, given Kansas's injury situation, um, I, that didn't feel like an, an upset in, in any way either. Um, but you know, I know coming into this, we said Tennessee didn't get the the easiest region with its draw. We didn't think, but um, as I've watched this tournament unfold for a week, I, I just think like. Anybody that's on the opposite side from the bra- of the bracket from UConn, like from this point going forward, you got to you got to say like, okay, that's not the absolute worst draw. Like, I, I would want to be as far away from UConn as as possible. Um, the, the way we've seen this this play out the first couple of rounds, and yeah, you know, I know it's early. UConn's obviously going to have some tougher matchups down the road, but they've looked like a buzzsaw. They they look deserving um, of that overall number one seed and and so if i'm tennessee i'm just i'm glad i'm i'm far far away from them in the bracket wouldn't have to see them until the national championship game Uh, how do you guys sort of handicap the bracket are you like me do you think that uconn is sort of the team you want to stay away from this point are they are they the team to beat or is there someone else that's kind of jumped out at you that uh, you've maybe thought oh hey i i wouldn't want to run into this this squad either they they entered as the team to beat and i think they remain that um and certainly Auburn losing to Yale in that that first round game opens it up even more for UConn, who's been dominant um, for obvious reasons. I mean, Northwestern has one player, um, one really good player in Boo Booey. That, that was never going to happen as a tough 8-9 second round matchup for UConn. So it, it remains that way. To me, I mean, obviously Houston had to survive last night after blowing a, a big lead late against Texas A&M. But Houston's looked better in this tournament than I thought they would going in because they really were clunky. Uh, against Iowa State in that Big 12 title game. So Houston's played well. I thought the way North Carolina, and we're just talking one seeds right now, obviously, but the way North Carolina handled Michigan State, which played pretty well for the first 30-ish minutes of that game. Um, I mean, North Carolina closed that game really, 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 really well. Um, That was impressive to me as well. So uh, I I think all those one seeds are sitting really nicely. I do think Purdue probably has the hardest matchup um, when you're talking about the Sweet 16 for the one seeds. So it's fallen about what you would have expected. Um, I, I think the Kentucky loss, obviously like that, that bracket turned into a little bit more chaos um, than, than I might've expected. I didn't expect Marquette to get to where it's at. Um, so that South region has been a bit surprising, but everything else I think has unfolded, you know, right about how you would have expected going in. Yeah. Going into the tournament, I didn't think UConn could win it because I think to win 12 straight NCAA tournament games, you almost have to be a super team. Uh, I'm going back to last season when it won it uh, and looked great doing so. I didn't think it was that good. I'm starting to change my mind on that. It's kind of looking like a super team. You lose uh, you lose three guys to the NBA and you still seem this dominant. And I'm always impressed, even against uh, lesser teams, when the favorite comes out and establish itself right away, eliminates any hope of an upset. This is it. We're going to roll over you and there's nothing you can do about it. And that's what we've seen with UConn. I really liked Houston against Texas A&M. I mean, that was a one of those NCAA classic games, uh, tournament classic games. And 
yeah, going into the tournament, scoring only 41 points against Iowa State, I thought, oh my gosh, why did I think Houston could win the national title? I think it could win the national title uh, still, and I think it would be a really bad matchup for Tennessee. Uh, Tennessee's in a tough region, but I, I think it could be in a worse region, a worse bracket right now. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And, and it's interesting the way the tournament uh, has shaken out because in the first round, you know, we saw quite a few upsets. Three, three of the 11 seeds won. Mike, as you mentioned, you know, Kentucky goes down to 14th seeded Oakland, Yale beats uh, Auburn. It, it was a pretty upset filled first round. But then now as we look at the Sweet 16, it's it's pretty chalky. I mean, you got NC State there as an 11 seed that's in the Sweet 16. But otherwise, every Sweet 16 team is a six seed or better. So, you know, the underdogs have kind of faded away for the most part after after their first round upsets. And you're going to see a lot of the, um, you know, the top dogs in, in the Elite Eight or, or beyond. Just as a, I guess, just as someone viewing the tournament, I kind of like when tournaments go this way. I mean, everybody loves to see the, as long as it's not your team going down, uh, everybody loves to see the round one upsets. But I do think it's it's sort of good for college basketball for your average fan when you have some of the top players in the country still around in the elite eight final four. So, I, I mean, I think from a viewer perspective, it's almost setting up as a, uh, uh, kind of a perfect tournament. You get the upsets early and then you get the star power, uh, potentially in, in the elite eight and, and beyond, which we didn't necessarily see that last year. Like last year was so upset filled. Um, you know, I think you got to the final four and your casual fans were like, now wait again, wait, wait, wait a second. Who's, who's on these teams? <laughs> uh, who's their leading score? I don't think it's going to be that, that way this year. I think we could see a, a lot of chalk in the end. Um, you know, we, we've talked about Kentucky going down. Um, and I wrote a column about this over the weekend. I, I thought Greg Sankey's comments uh, aged horribly uh, coming into the tournament, talking about how they're giving away bids to the little <laughs> conferences and needing to rethink that. Um, as, as I put it in the com my, my column, those comments aged like a fish on a pool deck, uh, on a summer day and, and Tennessee and, and Alabama are carrying the banner for the conference right now and doing a nice job of it. But when we think about, uh, Kentucky going down in the first round, Yale going, uh, y Yale beating Auburn, does it make you guys rethink how you, you viewed the sec this season? Uh, do you see it more as just a testament to this tournament that, you know, upsets can and, and do happen no matter what conference you, you come from. Uh, I guess, how do you how do you view things after what was, uh, spe especially in the first round, a pretty rocky showing from the SEC? Yeah, I mean, welcome to March, right? Um, yeah. I think there's two factors in play. One, that's the NCAA tournament. Um, that that happens. That's, that's why you see upsets. That's why people love it so much is a – Jack Golke from Oakland can hit some of the most absurd three pointers you've ever seen and drop a Kentucky team with two or three lottery picks on it. Uh, I mean, you, you see these things happen all the time. Uh, I do think when you look at it though, the Auburn loss was damaging and disappointing to the sec. Um, that's a team that talked a lot uh, after winning the sec tournament about it's under seeding. And then you immediately go and lose to Yale. Um, I mean, you, you can't do that. You can't have that happen. That, that was the most disappointing loss. Um, because we talked about it on these pods. The reality is Auburn and, or Alabama and Kentucky were boom and bust. They, they were going to go one of two ways, either catastrophically lose because of bad defense or advance because their offense is so good. And Alabama did one of those things. Kentucky did the opposite. Uh, I mean, Kentucky never learned to play defense the whole season. Uh, Cal talked a lot, I think after the Auburn game, about defense. We're, we're there, like all this stuff. And then you just you can't guard against Oakland. And Greg Campy's a great coach, by the way. We need to – Keep that in there. I, mean, I covered Michigan State for a few years, saw some Oakland games. Greg Campy is a good coach, um, but that's not a game that, that Kentucky and John Calipari can lose. So it was a very disappointing first weekend for the SEC outside of the two that advanced. It also was March. Um, so it's mm -hmm. kind of a, a twofold thing there of this is what happens, but it's also unfortunate when it happens to your league and then you see the Big East have no problem at all. And the Big East's argument of should have had more Big East teams in looks very, very valid, um, despite any results in the NIT because players sit out, different tournament, whatever. It, it's clear that some of those Big East teams, the St. John, Seton Hall, Providence, they probably should have gotten in over some of the other at-large teams that got in, uh, and that's how it shake, uh, shook out. Yeah, I, I clearly overrated the SEC, and I think a lot of that has to do with that's the, the league I watched 
and I hadn't seen a lot of these teams watching these teams in the NCAA tournament. Uh, yeah, I didn't know how good some of these teams were. Um, but there's just, it's inexcusable for Auburn to lose to Yale. That, that makes absolutely no sense. Um, the other losses, I mean, South Carolina got beat by an Oregon team. That's really hot. Uh, Oregon's really playing well, but just looking overall at the sec, it's not as good as I thought it was. Um, and part of that has to do with the uh, topsy-turvy nature of the NCAA tournament. But some of these teams, you know, we're going back to Tennessee's regional. Uh, I think those those teams in that regional, like Gun, not the, not number one seed uh, Purdue, but like Creighton and Gonzaga, they could have beaten other highly rated SEC teams. Um, Kentucky's a, a mess right now. That to me was almost as inexcusable as the Auburn loss because you let one guy who pretty much is a one trick pony uh, beat you. <laughs> yeah. And why in the world John Calipari had Reed Shepard guarding him at times, I have no idea. You have to play him. Cl- He's not going to drive around you and go to the basket. He's not Dalton Connect who can hit a three or dunk on you. He's not doing that. He's very limited. So it, it's preventable what happening in Kentucky just showed me nothing in that game. I thought I bought into the reasoning that Kentucky is this super talented team, slow to come together. And I looked on that win at Thompson bowling arena. I looked on the win that Mike referenced at Auburn. I thought they're going to the final four <laughs> <laughs> wrong again. <laughs> wrong again. Uh, all right, guys. Um, Sweet 16 matchup. Mike will have all the coverage from that game against Creighton. John will have the commentary. And uh, we'll see if Tennessee can get to that second Elite Eight in program history. You can read about it all over at knoxnews.com. And if Tennessee's still around in the Final Four next week, we'll be back here to discuss it. Thanks for listening to this edition of the Volunteer State.